Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul there declares to them, For this cause we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. Paul speaks of the thankfulness in the way that they received the word of God that he preached to them. The Bible is the word of God, and as such it is to be held by us in very high esteem. In Psalm 138 that we read this morning, it declares that God honored his word even above his name. Jeremiah said, if a prophet dreams a dream, let him tell his dream. But he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the wheat to the chaff, saith the Lord? Visions, dreams, and all, they come in the category of chaff when compared to the word of God, the rich wheat which nourishes and strengthens. One day as Jesus was teaching, there was a woman that was just filled with emotion with the things that he was saying. And she cried out, Oh, blessed is the womb that bore thee and the breast from which you nursed as she was seeking to honor his mother. And Jesus turned to her and said, Rather, blessed are they that hear my word and keep it. There is a special blessing that is pronounced for those that will keep the word of God and hear the word of God. The book of Revelation says, Blessed are they who read and who keep the words of this prophecy. In Psalm 1, David speaks of how blessed was the man who meditated in the law of the Lord day and night. He said he would be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. When Paul speaks about their receiving the word, that is a term that is used in the Bible to declare a person was saved. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 41, it said, And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And that same day there was added about 3,000 people to the church. In Acts 8, 14. Now when the church in Jerusalem had heard that the Samaritans had received the word, they sent unto them Peter and John. So the phrase receiving the word is an equivalent phrase to believing, accepting, and thus being saved. In Acts 17, we can read the word that Paul preached to those in Thessalonica because Acts 17 deals with Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. And there we read that Paul opened to them the scriptures and he alleged that the Messiah needed to suffer and to rise again and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Messiah. So when Paul says, the word which we preached you received, the word is that the Messiah, according to the scriptures, had to suffer and to die and to rise from the dead. And that Jesus, whom Paul preached, was the promised Messiah. Paul said, you didn't receive it as the word of man. There are many people who have never really seriously studied the scriptures. In fact, there are many who have never read the scriptures, 
who will declare to you that they believe the Bible is just the invention of man. That man needed something to believe in, and so he invented the Bible. That all of the miraculous stories that you read in the Bible are nothing more than mythology. Even as the Greeks had their mythology, the Romans theirs, so the Jews had their mythology, and all of these stories of Moses, Abraham, and all are just a part of Hebrew mythology. And so, because man just had to believe in something, he invented the Bible and made up all of these stories of how men related to God and through their relationship were made strong and were able to do marvelous things. Several years ago, in one of our trips to the Holy Land, the bus driver stopped and picked up an Israeli girl who was hitchhiking. She was in the military. She had her little Uzi and she had on her military clothes. And Kay and I always sit in the front seat of the bus, and so she was standing there uh, just in front of us, and Kay struck up a conversation with her. And she asked her if she believed in God, and she said, oh, no. And Kay said, well, have you ever read the Bible? She said, of course, we have to in school. It's required. She said, well, what do you think about the Bible? She said, it's just a book of myths because man has to believe in something. They made up all of these stories, but there's nothing to it. I then asked her the question, why do you believe that you have a right to be in this country? Why do you believe that you Jews have the right to come and to create a nation here to drive out the inhabitants and to create your own nation? Why do you have a right to do that? Why do you have a right to bear arms to defend the nation of Israel? And she said, well, God gave us this country. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> you told us you didn't believe in God. You didn't believe in the Bible. And if there is no God, and if the Bible is not the word of God, then you have absolutely no right of being here. But because we believe in God and we believe in the Bible, we believe that you have a right to live in this land because God promised it to Abraham and to his descendants. It's interesting how that oftentimes people who say that they don't believe, down deep inside, really do. Paul said, you received the word. Not as the word of man, but as the word of God, which it is. If the Bible was the invention of man, you must confess that they had to be the smartest men who ever lived. Forty-four different authors writing over the span of 1,500 years, and yet it is one unified story that has stood the time, the test of time, and of extreme critical analysis. That, at the least, is extremely remarkable. To write a book that would need absolutely no revisions except for language, that has bridged the millenniums of time, and it ministers to man here at the end of the 20th century just as powerfully as it ministered to men 5,000 years ago. You have to recognize that this is one remarkable book indeed. No other book has had such a profound influence for good in the world than the Bible. The Bible's been likened unto an anvil that has been hammered upon for centuries by skeptics and doubters. The hammers wore away and have been discarded, but the anvil still stands. Two centuries ago, that famous French philosopher, Voltaire, 
an avowed atheist, predicted that through his reasoning and through his writings, he was going to so totally destroy the Bible that within a hundred years, he said, Christianity would, will be nothing but a vanishing memory. A hundred years after Voltaire's death, the British Bible Society purchased the house that he lived in and they turned it into a Bible publishing house <laughs> filled with Bibles. Paul said, you received the word that we preach to you, not as the word of man, but as it actually is the word of God. We believe and we affirm that the Bible is the word of God. And as such, it is infallible and it is inerrant. It is God's revelation of himself to man. The Bible claims to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. David, at the end of his life, said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was in my tongue. In other words, all of those beautiful psalms that you read, David said that that was God speaking through him by his spirit. Jesus acknowledged David's claim. Jesus, talking to the multitude, said, or talking to the Pharisees, said, how then does David in spirit call him Lord? Peter also affirmed that David was speaking by the Holy Spirit in Acts 1.16. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, who was a guide to them that took Jesus. But acknowledging that the Holy Spirit spoke through David. And notice, not only is it inspired, but it is infallible. That is, it has to happen. The scriptures must be fulfilled. It is infallible. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Again, writing to Timothy, he said that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then speaking of Isaiah, Paul said, Well spake the Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet to our fathers. Peter said, for the prophecy of scriptures came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And thus, the Bible affirms over and over that it is God's word. It was inspired by the Spirit of God. And if you don't believe that, then the challenge is up to you to disprove that statement. It's an interesting thing. One of the powerful proofs that the Bible is indeed the word of God. God gave, he said, I will declare to you the end from the beginning. Declare to you things before they ever take place. And so that prophetic aspect of the Bible is a powerful proof that it is the word of God. In fact, God challenged the false prophets in the book of Isaiah. He said, prove your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong proofs, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what is going to happen. Let them show the former things what they're going to be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare to us the things that are going to come. 
Show us things that are going to come after, not after this, that we may know that you are God's. Yea, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and we might behold it together. Perform a miracle. Do something that will amaze us that we might realize that you indeed are God. Jesus said to his disciples, Now I've told you things, things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass you might know that I am he. Peter said, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when, he was, when there came a voice to him from the excellent glory that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him on the holy mount, that is the Mount of Transfiguration. But he said, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. I was there. I saw, I heard. But I have something that is even more certain than that, the sure word of prophecy, whereunto you will do well that you take heed as to a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in our hearts. The Bible is unique in its prophetic aspects. As it speaks of things a thousand years, 1,200 years, 2,500 years before they ever take place. Remarkable how that the Bible with such accuracy does predict things that will take place in the future. For instance, the rebirth of the nation of Israel was prophesied in the scriptures some 2,500 years ago. And it didn't happen until 1948. But yet it did happen. There were over 300 prophecies concerning the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled in his first coming. His birthplace in Bethlehem. His riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. The day that he would enter Jerusalem, 483 years from the time the commandment would go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. His betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, his scourging and death on the cross, the casting of the lots for his vesture, his hands and his feet being pierced. No wonder Jesus said to the scribes, you do search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but actually they testify of me. Some of the most remarkable prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament are found in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53 as Isaiah was prophesying concerning the coming Messiah. It is in Isaiah 52 and 53 that the mention of the death of Jesus is made. His suffering, he is being rejected and uh, his death, they're all mentioned there in Isaiah 52 and 53. And surely some of the most remarkable prophecies concerning the Messiah. And no doubt when Paul preached to those in Thessalonica that he makes reference to here. You received the word that I preached as it is indeed the word of God. No doubt Paul was preaching to them out of Isaiah 52 and 53 as well as Psalm 22 because he was alleging from the scriptures, their scriptures, that the Messiah had to suffer and die and rise from the dead. That was what he was alleging from the scriptures and that Jesus was the Messiah. So no doubt he was preaching to them out of Isaiah 52 and 53. The fascinating thing is that in these days in which we live, we have discovered that there are interesting words and names that are encoded in the scriptures. Uh, there's been a recent book written, The Bible Codes. Uh, this 
encoding in the scriptures is not new. It was discovered uh, almost a century ago by a, a Hebrew scholar and mathematician. And, and he discovered that in uh, the Old Testament, in the first book of Genesis, uh, or the first chapter that uh, in Genesis, the word Torah is encoded uh, in every 50 letters. And uh, they, they call it equidistant letter sequencing. And now with the advent of the computers, they've been able to set up computer programs to search for uh, coded names within the scriptures. And it is amazing what they are coming up with. For instance, in Isaiah 52 and 53, you would be amazed at the, at the things that are encoded there in this equidistant letter sequencing. For instance, in Isaiah 53.10, starting with the second Hebrew letter, Yod, that appears in the phrase, He shall prolong, Yarek, counting forward every 20 letters, you find the declaration or the words Yeshua Shemi Oz, which is, My name is Jesus. My powerful name is Jesus, more literally or completely. Right there in Isaiah 53:10, the prophecy of the Messiah. Yeshua Shemi, my name is Jesus. Isaiah 52 and 53, there are many other interesting words and names. For instance, the name Nazarene is encoded there. The word Messiah, the word Shiloh, which is another name for Messiah. The word Passover and, of course, Jesus was crucified on Passover. It's the scriptures that talk of his suffering and death, and encoded in it is Passover. He was the Passover lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The name of Caiaphas, high priest, is encoded there, as well as Annas, high priest, the two priests before Jesus appeared when he was condemned to death. Eleven names of the apostles are included there, all but Judas Iscariot. Also, three times the name Mary is encoded, and there were three Marys standing at the cross when Jesus was crucified. That's just a partial list. It's amazing the, the names and all that are encoded just in those two chapters of the Bible, but going throughout the Old Testament, more and more, they're discovering these encoded messages which are just absolutely fascinating. The things that God has revealed in a coded form. It sort of, again, puts sort of emphasis upon what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees when he said, you do search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but actually they are testifying of me. Beginning in... Genesis, the name Yeshua is encoded over and over when God made the uh, coats of skins and gave them to uh, Adam and Eve to cover the nakedness. Again, the word Yeshua is encoded in that passage there. And throughout the prophecies of the Old Testament, you find over and over again encoded the name Jesus, Yeshua. There's been a fascinating book written recently by a Jewish scholar, Yaakov Ramsell, who has been doing a tremendous amount of research on the subject. And uh, the book is entitled, His Name is Jesus, and it's published by the Frontier Research Publications. But it's a fascinating book as he takes you through the Hebrew and shows you all of the encoded messages thus far. Of course, they've just begun this science, and it has a long way to go. They estimate that uh, the, the, there in Isaiah 53.10, 
uh, it is actually a 20 letter sequences, uh, that the chances of finding the name, you know, my name is Jesus, uh, that it's only one in 50 quadrillion that that could appear in a random selection like it, like it is there. Amazing. Paul said, you received what I preached to you as the word of God, which indeed it is. You received it as the word of God, which indeed it is. And then Paul testifies concerning the word, which effectually works also in you that believe. The power of the word of God working in the lives of people. Here we see evidence today, surrounded by evidence, of the power of the word of God that works in the lives of people. Sitting here today, we have people whose lives were once totally messed up and destroyed by drugs or by alcohol, by sin in some form or the other. And now they're set free, they're redeemed, they're walking with the Lord. Their lives are now worthwhile. Their lives are meaningful because God works effectually in people. It brings great changes within people. Not only the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago, but today the word of God is still alive and powerful and is able to effect changes in people's lives. Jesus said, now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. And that effectual working of the word of God in cleansing and washing us from our past sins, from the degradation of the the things of the world in which we were once so involved, God's word and the power of God's word to set you free from the bondage of the enemy that was destroying your life. And so Paul testifies to the Thessalonians that you received it as it truly is, the word of God, which is able to make and affect tremendous changes in our lives. Oh, I'm so blessed to have the privilege of declaring to people God's word, that it is indeed God's word, and it is able to transform a person from death into life, from darkness into light, the word of God that we preach. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to preach your word. And how we thank you, Lord, for the effects when the word is received, the changes, the power in the word to transform lives. And Lord, today, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that the changes, the glorious changes that were wrought in those in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago who had received the word, those same changes are being wrought today in those who are receiving your word. Help us, Lord, that we might receive your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? You say, well, you know, that random kind of sequential, I don't know, you know. Well, it's interesting. They've, they've tried it with other books, other documents, and they don't seem to be able to come up with much. Imagine if you would, say, put uh, the... Constitution into a computer. And then you search for the first time the letter G appears. And then 
you sort of count how many letters until E appears. And say that uh, in 20 letters, the E appears. So you've got now the code. 20 more letters, uh, you fi should find an O. Another 20 letters, R. And then another 20, a G. And another 20, an E. You say, wow, we're onto something. George. <laughs> 20 more letters, maybe a W. And then an A, and then an S, and an H. George Washington, encoded in the, wow, you know, those guys really were, you know, how did they figure that all out? And yet they're in the Bible, inspired by God. Simple thing for God. You know, it would be impossible to write a document and, and put those kind of coded things in it. But it's a simple thing for God to get his message across, not only plainly, but cryptically encoded. Jesus, my name is Jesus, or my powerful name is Jesus, actually is the full encoding there. Right in the scripture that speaks of the Messiah and his suffering for us. Paul said, Jesus the Messiah had to suffer and to die and to rise again. And that Jesus who I preach is the Messiah. You can believe it or not. But as many as believed to them, he gave the power to become the sons of God. It works in them effectually. He that believeth shall not be condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, Jesus said, because he hasn't believed in the only begotten of the Father. Believe it or not. But there's a vast difference between believing and not believing. The vast difference is between heaven and hell. And to believe will work in you effectually. It will bring you pardon from your sin. It will bring you a new life, a life of holiness and purity through Jesus Christ. It will bring to you the power of God. This morning, if God's Spirit is speaking to your heart and you'd like to experience the power of God's Word in your life, I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room. Pastors and counselors will be back there to pray with you, to help you discover the effectual power of the Word of God as it is able to transform your life and make you a child of God.